Awesome. <laughs> Welcome America and around the world. This is Charity Smith. I am Ms. Mogul and I am the host of Power Talk. It has been my delight to host this phenomenal business icon in our series today. You all have been with me now for three sessions with the one and the only Sharita Oglesby. Let me tell you a little bit about this young lady, uh, just in case this is your first time chiming in. This dynamic business leader is a highly sought after speaker, motivational best-selling author, radio personality, and business strategist. She, po uh, she possesses nearly 30 years of community economic uh, experience and expertise. And here's what I love about her. She has raised over $30 million for global projects. She is um, actually a sage. That's what I've been calling her behind the scenes. And I wanted to kind of give her that accolade here publicly. Global speakers, global um, business leaders, go global philanthropists, go and have counsel with her to find out how to make their projects come to fruition. How does the big idea happen? The big idea, in my opinion, does not happen, especially in, in nonprofits, until you sit down and you have a conversation with the one and the only Sharita Oglesby. So <laughs> without further ado, Welcome one more time, my sister and my friend, to Power Talk. I am absolutely delighted to have you here for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I've enjoyed all of the series and uh, just the energy between you and I. It's always a good feeling. So I look forward to it. Ooh, that, that does my heart good. And let me tell you, it's always <laughs> mutual. I want to do a recap right quick for those who may be tuning in now for the first time. This has been meat on the bones. That's a phrase I use time and time again because, you know, I'm from the South and I like food. Um, but <laughs> it has been so nourishing for people who have big ideas and big visions and wonder how in the world do we scale? How do we take the big idea from our mind, from our visionary space, and now how do we manifest that? And as a visionary, I've been looking for ways to do that that would also have a heart component. I'm big on compassion in business. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how in the world do the two marry? In my world, I didn't see how they married until we had a conversation. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> the first conversation was all about where do I begin as a visionary? So we've been talking about folks who are in, in the real estate industry primarily. How do we right. make real estate bigger as if it isn't already big, right? But how do we put our footprint in real estate? So if we're in for-profit, how do we now maximize the nonprofit space? And you walked us through how big the nonprofit space is. And one of the things you said that really resonated with me, Sharita, is that nonprofits have gained the, the reputation in some circles of being no profit. And mm -hmm. you have shown us methodically how that certainly just is not the truth. They are extremely right. profitable. And actually, nonprofits are kind of what hold up the U.S. economy in many cases, if you really do your research. Absolutely. Yes. So, um, well, see, the thing is, is that we're talking about property and how do nonprofits benefit. But what most people don't look at is that even the larger municipalities, the reason why as far as it's, it's, it's property and see a lot of the larger businesses uh, from even schools, see schools are really nonprofits as far as government is concerned. And look how much property schools own. And see, when you are in that in that industry, um, ownership as far as under a 501c3 or is not paying property taxes. And why? Because you are providing services to um, populations that otherwise would not be receiving what you receive, like public school is free. Mm -hmm. And you guys, again, my my roosters are crowing. So you're going to hear that. And, and which is a good thing because it reminds me about how so many of you are wanting to, uh, to purchase property in rural areas like where yeah. we are right now and we're homesteading. Yeah. And so uh, depending on your structure, whether you set it up as a nonprofit or you are you're a for profit leasing your property to your nonprofit, it's all about which way you structure on which way your benefits will flow. Okay. Okay. So that's a great springboard then. 
into how we're going to move into this last segment. So um, mm -hmm. tying together, yeah, that was only segment one. And you can tell you guys, if you have not done so already, go back and listen to that first interview that I did with Sharita and you will get really an expansive conversation about how to uh -huh. structure your, your nonprofit corporation properly. This is a business. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing we really drove home in the uh, first segment. Second segment was now what were the logistics? Uh, what were the various um, structures that were possible? And we talked about the CDC and the 501c3 and how there are various codes under 501c3 that help mm -hmm. you to achieve um, your your objective. But you have to know, first of all, what those codes are and how they match. And that's why we need mm -hmm. to talk to experts like you to make sure that our applications are not rejected and we don't spend a year <laughs> trying to get approved. Because uh, uh, yes, that's a nightmare. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then, and um, exactly. I'm trying to get my little rascals under control. I have two indoor dogs that <laughs> always, you know, no. animals are like children. They want to act up when you're on the phone. Um, but yeah, yeah I get again, you're, a, a nonprofit is a corporation. And if you're going to be a 501c3 organization or any other kind of nonprofit, there are 29, 29 different C organizations from 29 to C11 to C6, C8, um, you're going to be a corporation. It's best now, if the most popular, and if you're going after grants, is a C3. And you've got to become a corporation first. And that document goes along with your tax exempt application, which is the form 1023. Now, you um, you mentioned earlier before you and I got on about Georgia and that, uh, those families. You know, that would be my segue in. Yes. So like, matter of right fact, let, me, yeah, right let me set that up so that people know what we're talking about. Um, and I just want to give them again, kind of a quick review into what today's conversation would be about. So I hope what you understand about segments one and two, that foundation and structure are paramount. You have to set it up properly if you're going to get to the to uh, today's conversation, which is the big mm -hmm. idea, the big legacy work. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to um, frame this conversation around the families and what I call the cohorts in Georgia. And they made national news. Many of you may have read about them. Um, it's a family and they formed this investment coalition with friends and with neighbors who wanted to buy land in Georgia. They succeeded in doing that. They purchased 97 acres in an unincorporated area in Georgia with the mindset of initially they were going to buy an established city. But then they found out, of course, that the city itself wasn't for sale. It was just business, uh, businesses and certain buildings in that particular small town that were up for sale. Mm -hmm. But these people had a big idea where they wanted to own a city. And so they got together and they bought the 97 acres. Now, Sharita, we have had conversations about homesteading and about uh, Oklahoma's Black Wall Street. All of this stuff was kind of off script, just our personal conversations. But we see now that the model is alive and well. I want to talk to those people today who may have a big idea, particularly in real estate, or you may not be in real estate, but you want to find a way to get in, right? And you have legacy work in mind. Youth are a concern for you. Health is a concern for you. Where you live and your quality of life is a concern for you. And you're thinking, yeah, I want to build a city too, or I have a big idea too. Walk us through, where does that begin? First of all, we know we have to have the structure, right? The 501c3, the CDC, or whatever that business structure is going to be. But how do we then use that nonprofit, first of all, to form an investing coalition? What are the benefits of people coming into that kind of business structure for the sake of building, say, a city? Well, first, start where you are. See, sometimes you can start too big and you don't have the track record to back yourself up. Oh, so, well, there's that. And let's qualify that because the lady who did that was a real estate agent and she was working with other real estate agents in Georgia. So that's a very good point. You have to know where you are, who your team members are, and again, where you started. But to your point, yeah, get started, even if it's smaller. Again, you'll probably be wanting to go after funding. And if you don't have the background to show 
why a funder should fund you. Now, I'm not trying to discourage someone from doing that, but start where you are. Um, many of your, your target group that you speak to are already into real estate and investing. So start where you are and in the community that you're in. So it may be that initially you're purchasing in an apartment building for low income housing or you're purchasing several single family dwellings for low income individuals so that you can start getting funding for people that are in transition. You want to go after transitional funding, uh, general operating dollars, depending on where you are. If you're in a rural area for less than 100 where there's less than 150,000 people, you can go after rural development funding that also can aid with housing, but also job creation, business development. Uh, in Georgia alone, um, let me just look. It was around in September. Let me see uh, if I can go to that. Um, yes, September 1st, uh, the Trump administration in Georgia released $1.3 million for, through the USDA for rural business development grants. And so, again, it depends on where you are. But that's why I say start where you are so that mm -hmm. so that you can build from your current operations or your current history or your current collaborations to show that you have the capacity to then br branch out. Let's say that your family owns also that's been sitting there 100 acres in Mississippi. Well, you take the history of what you've been doing in your local area, and now you want to utilize the land that you have to start building around that. Now, like the town that, that you mentioned or that family, they built out side, I think it's called Toonsboro. Mm -hmm. um, well, see, yeah, Toonsboro, when I was looking at that town, the way that this family can benefit, see what's happening across the United States, they're calling it the graying of America. Small towns all over the nation are drying up because brain drain is happening. Young people can't wait to get older and leave that town and not come back. So they're not bringing the the their talents and abilities back home after they leave for college or whatever. They're in the big city where they want to be, where all the action is, and not bringing that that knowledge back home. Well, small towns should be focusing on preserving those individuals in that small town because even Toonsboro, almost fifty percent of the people are forty five and older. So what's yeah. happening with towns is that people are getting older. The the values of their homes are dropping. Uh, sit from city hall to small businesses are drying up and there's no money coming in to reinvest into those towns for the sustainability, which is how I, I, I'm i so busy here in Arkansas because I'm coaching small towns. A lot of people aren't even aware that Arkansas has 52 black mayors in small towns and in the and four of the largest cities also they're black mayors. Now, I'm not only talking to black people and black towns, but that's pretty substantial in a Southern yeah. state. And Absolutely. so that's the same thing is happening across the Bible Belt. I've coached uh, uh, mayors um, across the Bible Belt of Mississippi. They're looking for infrastructure dollars. Yes. So like you and your team, if you're thinking of doing that in small towns, you wanna be looking at infrastructure funding, especially for rural development, because there's funding to for rebuilding of, of bridges, uh, roads. I coached a mayor here locally before they got their 500,000 to um, put a new road through their town. So again, it depends on what you're going to do, where you're going to do it. But all I'm saying to you is if you are working in an area that's going to help a small town grow and sustain, or if you're looking at working with individuals, whether it's low income housing and transition, there's funding for you. So it's just, it just depends on how you want to structure. So you, you bring again, so much, so much information. Um, and I like the idea of scalability of the project for those people who have that big idea and may think I can never do that. The idea of starting where you are with multifamily is really appealing because, again, it does give you the opportunity to experiment kind of with an ecosystem, if you will, of how does infrastructure work around your multifamily. You have to worry about drainage and, and easements and plumbing. and You have to think about all of those things. And in order for it to be attractive, you do have to worry about where the street signs are, especially if there are children in that multifamily. So where are the mm -hmm. stoplights? 
like? Where are the stop signs? Where are the sidewalks, et cetera? So it gives you that opportunity to, to, again, get your feet wet, work with your municipality on what that looks like so that you can develop then not only the track record, but then probably your own idea if you want to branch out at some point mm -hmm. and scale the project. Yes. And when, you, when you're speaking of municipality, what is the zoning? See, like I had one of my clients in Los Angeles, she had done all this work with a home that she had sitting there, turned it into transitional housing for me and recovering uh, from substance abuse. Beautiful facility. And the way she had done the, the bedrooms that were housing two men per bedroom, but the way they had privacy, she even had turned a back house into their laundry facilities. And in front of that was their lounge area. Do you know she had to tear all of that out? Yes. Because she had not checked with zoning yes. to see the area was zoned only for single family dwelling or could she do transitional facility? And they had put a mandate on any new transitional facilities coming into the area. So you've got to, you've got to do your homework exactly. prior to whatever you're planning is you've got to know the kind of homework that you need to do in order to make that happen. And that's so important that you know that zoning has everything to, to do with how you're taxed, Right. If it's agriculture, mm -hmm. if it's zoned for, as you said, residential, if it's zoned for commercial, you don't know mm -hmm. that until you know, again, how it's zoned. So mm -hmm. great idea and big point there. So if you're taking notes and hopefully you are, do your due diligence, get familiar with how the, the zoning around those municipalities work again. So you'll have the track record. And when you go to get the funding, those questions may be asked of you. So have you done your zoning and you'll be able to state those kinds of things. Tell us. Yes. So and, and, yes, go ahead. And, and what a lot of people don't realize that's even in the for-profit arena. See, someone may be looking yes. at putting a large apartment building in an area or maybe mixed use, but they've got to check. Everyone has to check with zoning. Zoning exists for a reason. Um, and even that client I spoke of, we we went and we went to the city council meeting to try and fight against her having to tear all that out. Well, had she gone to city council in advance and she could have gotten kind of like an, a, a, a grandfathering because there yeah. were other facilities in the area where she could have gotten an advance approval based on certain things. But see, you uh, again, You've got to make sure that you check areas before you start because she had spent a lot of money and it didn't matter. It had to be torn out. But guess what else happened? The What's woman that? that lived right next door, we found this out, was a real estate investor. And because this was an older lady, my client, she actually is the one that called on her and her and her son wanted to buy that property. So see, there's people that will set you up based on what their desires are also. And so these are things that we found out. It's not that the city automatically knew what she had done. Someone called, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's best to make sure that you do things in order because there are haters, you know, and this woman <laughs> really was going. Yeah. Yeah. She was doing good. And she really had a passion for working with her, the population that she was focused on. Um, but she had a hater that actually thought she was going to be able to buy this property up under this senior woman and be able to expand whatever she wanted to do with her property. So just make sure you do things in order so that you don't run into the same kind of issue that my client did. And so that kind of goes back to segment one, knowing who the team players are. Make sure you have a good attorney on hand. Make sure that you have great consultants on hand, tax preparers, accountants. All of that goes back into structure before you start digging the ground. And there's an analogy um, that we talk about in real estate where you have to go for example, if you want to build an 80 story uh, skyscraper, you have to have an 80 story foundation. The point being is you have to do all of that work, that due diligence, you have to dig to make sure this is the right idea, that your idea can be right. held up in market, etc. So it goes back to that right. analogy, right? Do that yes, due diligence yes, and make sure you have the proper foundation before you launch and start to now invest money. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. we can state that enough, right? That that needs yes, to be the yes. case. And yes. I want to go and back then, and Yes, go ahead. Well, this goes back to the initial of what we were talking about, even in segment one about job creation. Understand that whichever way, even when you start where you are, it still is job, it, it can be ex the exact job creation that is your ultimate goal also. Because even if you start with that apartment building, let's say it's a sixplex or an eightplex or whatever, then again, 
like you and I talked about the last segment, as a developer, you probably work with a construction company to rehab or to prepare those houses that you guys purchase to get them ready for a move in. And so if whether you work with a regular construction company or you have your own, again, it can be your own habitat for humanity. And that's just a popular one that all of us know about. But you can have your own construction company that's training in vo vocational training, whether it's plumbing, electrical, whatever. And, and whether it's not only uh, doing the rehabbing for your facilities, but to ensure that you're not developing your nonprofit just to benefit you and your business, that same program can also be doing the construction on other low-income homes and you've got a full-fledged construction company there's a perfect one there it's called um ah oh i can't think of the name of it but they they did a like a a eight eight mil eight billion dollar project in boston uh with the joan joan um croft foundation and they actually rehabbed an island and on that island they built like four tennis courts uh, two basketball courts um and they all the materials everything was brought there on barges but all of it was funded by grants and so I, i'm saying that to say that you do not have to think small when you are working in this arena think big and have big projects and big outcomes because that's what they're looking at if you're asking for whether it's 5,000 or 50 million, make sure if you're asking for 50 million that you have 50 million in outcomes that you're expecting and that you're that. And, and I and I know you're using scaling, but in the nonprofit arena, they call it capacity. Do you have the capacity to do what you say that you're going to do for the amount of money you're requesting? And there's a way to build capacity into a project if it is not initially there. You can build capacity and scale into the project. And I want to go back to the whole theme of the show being legacy and the big idea. So we start with uh -huh. where you are and it could be mm -hmm. uh, developing low income housing, et cetera. But I also want to expand the conversation. So let's just say that your legacy work may not be low income housing. But if you're like me, you have a passion for the environment. So big ideas mm -hmm. and legacy work can take on many phases, particularly in mm -hmm. real estate. For, so mm -hmm. for those people who have a passion for the planet and a passion for conservation, you can create a lifestyle, um, a municipality, a lifestyle around the idea of eco living. There's tons mm -hmm. of money. If, and, and if you really think about it, Sharita, this the legacy work is really about problem solving that will last generations. For those people who went to Georgia and created that system and that city, I remember the realtor saying that she did that because um, she was concerned about her son, who happens to be African-American, growing up in an environment that was toxic. And so she literally mm -hmm. wanted to create a city for her son to grow up in. So that was her passion. Mm -hmm. So for those mm -hmm. of us who may be uh, saying, yeah, that's my passion, but I also have a passion for the planet and I want to create a paradigm around eco living. And so this uh -huh. is all about solving problems generationally. And so that's what I want our listeners to really take away from the show. It's about generational problem solving. Case in point, we talked about um, the building uh, and creating jobs. If you mm -hmm. can now bring your legacy work into where the industry is going, right? With eco um, uh -huh. building, and with we call it lead building right now, but green uh -huh. building and really problem solve with conservation of energy, with sustainable materials, with recycling and purifying our water and not bringing chlorine in it. If you can think uh -huh. about now how to diminish land fields and waste fields and not dump plastic into our oceans, but use it as a building or a purifying agent in your building. Now we're talking about legacy work. Talk to us about the money that's available now for problem solving in those areas. So you have, let's say five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres of land, mm -hmm. or you may have bought, um, let's say that you bought a multifamily. How can we now revise that multifamily that already exists to start now meeting an eco-friendly um, living under, living environment and now problem solve on a large scale well one of the things that i suggest in any area 
start developing a relationship with your USDA department and your, um, um, uh, gosh, I Department of Agriculture different. is another good one. I all work a lot those. with them. All of them. Yes, all Department of, of Agriculture, <laughs> USDA, HUD, and then your state agencies have the same kind of uh, departments statewide as well. Yes, because those are that's how all the larger municipalities are being funded. You guys understand that your city is not functioning without grants. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Operate like the big boys or the big girls. That's how they're doing so much of what they do. It's just a lot of, of, of small startups, those that are just stepping into the nonprofit arena, small town mayors do not realize that that's what's happening. Your governor of every state goes into the, the, the Washington and they there's maybe USDA is releasing coming in 2021, 890 billion. And each governor goes in there and they meet and based off of their census, they're saying how much they need for whatever it is going on, whether it's roads, you know, their infrastructure funding, their school funding, whatever. And then they bring it back to their state and the cities, the mayors now meet with the governor and show what kind of funding they need for their particular city. It's just a lot of our small towns are not doing it. But then what happens is the cities now release you know, 10, 10 trillion for this, 5 billion for this, this much for education. And now your nonprofits and smaller municipalities are going after those grants, which are what you guys end up seeing. What so I'm saying to you. OK, and sorry to cut you off, Sharita, but I wanted to throw this point in there. And if that money isn't used, then with the city may not get it again. So we have to get aggressive about getting that money to make sure it stays in the city. Am I right? Yes, but in most cases it's used, it's just a lot of our communities miss out on it. And then we get angry because we say everybody else is getting the funding, but you haven't learned how to go after the funding. Believe me, a lot of it is being used <laughs> or your cities would not be getting the new streets and the, st mm -hmm. and the parks and uh, new, you know, you see new developments that are happening. That's what's happened across the nation with the whole regentrification as far as what's happening with the re redevelopment of the downtown areas. Yes. See, yes. they have gotten stimulus funding. Builders have gotten tax credits to go in and revitalize these downtown areas, which is now creating these multi-million dollar units, which are the condos that are coming downtown and all the mixed use. We'll see our small towns could be doing the same thing. And you guys as realtors could be a part of that. You do not have to be one of these major big developers to still get a piece of the pie. Your piece would just be based on what your capacity is. It's just a lot of times we don't look at it because we think that we are not uh, some kind of way it can be included. And what I'm saying to you is that you can. It's just knowing that the money is available and how do you go after it and what is going to be your your explanation of what you're going to do to do with your piece of the pie. That's why a lot of in, in every redevelopment that's going on across the nation, there's an arts and culture piece. And None of these downtown areas would be growing without arts and culture because that's also what draws people, not just business per se, but you, there's, there's whether it's jazz, restaurants, um, museums, art galleries, all of that is happening in those areas. And a lot of our small towns are not looking at that as the draw also. Now, if I can, the other thing that's helping the smart, that, that is happening across the nation and millennials are really big on doing this, is homesteading, which is what Ray and I are doing here. Yes. Yes. Homesteading is so much bigger now because look at the opportunities that exist that didn't exist even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, meaning any business that you're doing, like all of us are doing it right now with COVID-19, we're on right now like you and I. You're in Georgia, I'm sitting here in Arkansas, and we're teaching and we're conducting business. And people are not realizing that you can do that and homestead. That's why you hear my dog right now at the door wanting to get in. You hear my roosters. We've got, you know, 15 chickens, four, well, three ducklings now. Um, had nine guinea. But you guys, that's part of homesteading. And some wild dogs came up and got to our guinea. But I'm, I'm doing the exact same business that I was doing in Los Angeles. Had been there 30 years. 
And now with my husband and I relocating here to Arkansas, my business has not stopped. Matter of fact, now during COVID-19, I'm doubling in business. I'm on my, and I've been doing virtual training, which made it easy for me to do the relocation. I've been doing virtual training since 2014, mm -hmm. but I'm doing more, more training virtually now since COVID-19 than I've done in, in 10 years. So, so much you of that is only so much of that though is built upon a plan. And having an entrance structure, um, a strategy part me, and an exit strategy, or just a transitional mm -hmm. strategy, knowing how you're going to do it. I like the point uh -huh. you bring up that this can be done by anybody. It's doable. Mm -hmm. You have to, mm -hmm. one, know who your players are at the table. What's the big idea? So you have this big, fabulous idea, but now it's the logistics. It's where the rubber meets the road. How do you get from the big idea into now it's 3D, it's 4D, it's here, it's tangible. Know who your yes. players are, kind of reviewing where we were. Know who the players are. Know what your business structure is. Do your due diligence. Make sure you understand the zoning. Understand too that there are so many ways to create new opportunities within that big idea. You think it's one thing, but if you think creatively, you can find out that you have at least 100 to maybe even 500 jobs in that one project. So legacy work just about all. the project. I'm sorry, go ahead. And you don't have to do it all. That's why grant funders want to see your collaborations. That you don't absolutely. Have to do it all. And so it's about creating a sense of community around the project, even, right? Mm -hmm. So not just that, but even the planning of it, making sure, going back to your point, when grantors and funders look at a project they want to know in the for profit world, we call it scale. Nonprofit, we call capacity, but they want to know that you can actually perform. I think it's really about the word performance. Can you perform what you're asking us to fund? That's the mm -hmm. question. Can you perform mm -hmm. what you're asking us to fund? And when you have yeah. all of that in play, then you can put your foot on the gas. And I like mm -hmm. the idea, too, um, of what we're talking about. Sharita, with the smaller cities now starting to think creatively, people are leaving the big areas, the more urban areas, and they're looking at rural areas to create the lifestyle they want. Great mm -hmm. company in Los Angeles, but there's nothing like being in Arkansas doing the same thing with fresh air. Um, I'm mm -hmm. here in Texas. And to your point, we're able to scale now with COVID. If we're thinking creatively, we're able mm -hmm. to scale. But you all, even mm -hmm. in land, so my world is land uh, investing. There are so many opportunities now where people are wanting to buy up land in these remote areas because they want a different lifestyle. They still want to yeah. be able to connect when they connect, but it's really now people are looking inward. There is a heart that is emerging in, in business and even in lifestyle. People are really wanting to know purpose, lifestyle, um, meaning of life. And they're finding that now by kind of branching out, going to some of the more remote areas and doing some creative things around lifestyle. Who would have thought a, a sister from uh, California would be in Arkansas <laughs> homesteading, but then doing uh, this kind of work. Same lifestyle and, and also passion. Lifestyle and that, passion. When you start, it's your so passion. Important. Your passion is what I have found with all the business coaching that I do. Your passion is your gift from God. It is it is what you have a desire to do. And then oftentimes most people haven't realized that they can be paid to do it. And that's where I came up with my term with faith comes finance. Now, just like coming here, I, I knew that my husband loved the outdoors, all of that. I had no idea the talent that he had for woodworking. He's in heaven here too. See, he hasn't done woodworking since he was in high school. And in most high schools, that's not even available any longer. It's not. So that's why we're, along with our programming, we're developing a woodworking program, not only for youth, but there are a lot of seniors that love it. So they can be here doing woodworking in the morning. And then after school or weekends is where we will have youth and woodworking. See, in addition to what you do every day, that's making you money right now. What I'm saying to you is your passions should also be making you money. 
because whatever God has gifted you, there's absolutely no way that he gifted that to you and you can't survive off of it. So what I'm saying is along with your purchasing of your land and all of what you're going to be doing on your land, whether it is someone that is um, working with the um, uh, saving the environment and as far as electrical now installing the um, um, solar panels and the solar panels, like one of my clients in Colorado, he is now one of the, he, he received an award for one of the largest solar panel installations um, in the, in the uh, state. And he's doing that through his nonprofit that we developed to do solar panels, like for the Indian reservations and all of that. So yeah. whatever you're doing in your for-profit, and that's why when I'm working with my clients, I say your nonprofit should follow the exact path that you're on with your for-profit. Because I guarantee you that there are individuals, they, excuse me, they, can you get his food? He's crunching right here. And I know that people can hear him. You got <laughs> Ah, oh, that's part of being here on steady. But the thing is that uh, uh, your nonprofit should follow the exact path that you're on. There are people that that you're way able to work with that are here that can afford you. There are people here that want your service that can't that cannot afford you. Through the nonprofit arena, you get grants that evens the playing field, so that now you don't have to turn people away. You've got your for-profit that's serving those clients and you have your non-profit that can serve the other clients that you would have otherwise missed. Okay? I love the idea in closing. This is such a great way to end the segment. The non-profit is all about the passion coming forward, right? It really is about that. It's, it's that humanity work that does not have to be um, just given away. There is a way to make it profitable. I absolutely yes. love that. For those who have been looking for a way to um, change even lifestyle and how they do business, it just may mm -hmm. be that your business model completely evolves once your nonprofit is, is where it should be. You may even find, yes. yeah, I think I'd rather work here than work here because there's the opportunity for that alignment that I'm so big on, that head and heart alignment to come into fruition. There is a space for that in nonprofit. Mm -hmm. That's the part Absolutely. I think is so appealing to me. And so appealing we'll to, to all of you who may be listening, that's what's appealing. Uh, Sharita, <laughs> we are at the end of our segment. No uh, surprises there that we always run out of time and not content. <laughs> That's it. We always run out of time and never a content. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. How can people get in contact with you? How do they connect with you? They can go to my website at philanthropyalliance.org. Philanthropyalliance.org. They also should go there and subscribe. There's a subscribe button and they'll get the free grant info and other information that we send out. I'm also on Facebook at Sharita Herring Making a Difference. That's Sharita Herring making a difference. Talk about your new blog that's launched. Ah, it's called Yo-Yo, Y-A-Y-O-L dot org. And Yo-Yo stands for you are your only limitation. And on that blog, we're talking about homesteading. We're talking about love and relationships. We're, we're even talking about guns. I mean, my husband uh, is going to be talking about gun safety. He's a, he's a collector and um a lot of people just don't even, I mean, when they think of guns, they think of the negative, but especially when you're homesteading, when you're out here, I mean, you guys, we have bears, we, it's a <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's just about being safe. And, um, but also we're going to be talking about barbecuing. He's a major caterer. He, his last big event, he cooked a hundred pork butts. His grill is nine feet. It's called Raise Nine Feet of Flavor. So the blog is about all of our passions, all of the things that we're doing in community and everything that we're doing as far as homesteading. So, and thank you for asking. And so, and thank you for allowing me to share information and to be a part of your uh, very informative uh, blog. And uh, I just thank you for honoring me as being one of your guests. I would have it no other way. It's been a pleasure. So everyone, again, make sure that you get on her mailing list, get the information regarding grants. I cannot um, edify you enough to do that. 
there is a lot of information there that you can begin to benefit from and digest now going into the next year. So I'm going to host a, a big kind of brainstorming event, probably at the end of December. And I'll invite you to come back to that. But I really am passionate about people having a different perspective in the upcoming year. 2020 mm -hmm. has been, um, it's been an, a very unusual time. It hasn't been all negative. We hear the negative because that's good for ratings. But it's been a very yeah. interesting time when it comes to creativity and innovation and passion. Yeah. People are stripping away what's not important. I think people are really starting to hone into purpose, what's important. Um, the Joneses don't matter. It's my family and my passion that really matters. It's who I mm -hmm. am, who God created me to be. That's what's really important. So people are kind mm -hmm. of finding their way to that path. And I want to keep my hand on that pulse. So I'm going to host an event at the end of the year. I'll invite you back for that. Um, and and I'll, you all stay tuned to that. You can find out more about that uh, as time progresses at mommyscreatingeconomies.com. Now, you may be asking, what is that all about? The whole philosophy about Mommy's Creating Economies is create your own economy. That is our mantra. So you're um, living, your lifestyle, your investment, how you in, in, uh, pay for your children's education, all of that can be done with real estate if you understand how to structure your businesses and if you have the plan. So if you want to know more about that and how you can burn the ladders of corporate America and build your own sense of well-being in real estate, I would love to show you how to do that. Again, go to mommyscreatingeconomies.com blogs are there information is there subscribe to that website as well and you'll also find our connection to sharita there as well her information will be in the events and uh in the ooh, lack of sleep the uh the photos not photos the videos there we go Come on. I was up all night looking at the elections, y'all. So uh, all of that information will be in the segment, how you can uh, connect with her. So we'll make sure that we facilitate that connection as well. Sharita, thank you again for being my, uh, my host, my guest, um, for being a source of information for being the answer. And that's something too, we, I always ask for before these segments start, I pray that we're the answer for somebody. I absolutely believe you have been that and so much more. So thank you for sharing freely of your time, your information, your edification, your expertise. You have just been a whale of goodness and a whale of wisdom. So I appreciate you. I honor you. Thank you again for being here. And I promise you, this is not even close to the last collaboration. There's more to come. I can guarantee it. Thank you. All right. Thank you again for being my guest. Thank all of you for joining me for Power Talk. Subscribe. These are the kinds of conversations you all that leaders are having now. Tune in, connect to these communities. We'll see you next time.